I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And this is Celebrity Memoir Book Club. The podcast where if you take a memoir and you dip it in ayahuasca, we're what comes back out. Oh my God. We're like the nightmare of your super ego. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have any other good comparisons for this book. We're going to read a memoir. We're going to tell you the interesting parts. If you don't want our takes, don't listen to us. If you are interested in what we have to say, then hey, baby, come on in. The ayahuasca is warm. And if you think that this was so fun, you will die when you see us live. At our live shows, we do stand up. We do a mini essay. We do games about our memoirs. It's fun for the whole family. It's a different show every time. We really hope to meet you. We will have tour exclusive merch that we've been promising for a while, but finally just got delivered. We will be in D.C. and Philadelphia this weekend. Philadelphia on November 3rd, D.C. on November 4th. Tickets are still available to both. I'm pretty sure they were selling out quick, though. Yeah. And then we are in Denver and then San Francisco, and we cannot wait to meet everybody. We love you guys so much. And of course, don't forget about the Christmas Spectacular. We will be at the Bell House in Brooklyn on December 7th and 8th. We are also coming to Los Angeles and Phoenix, January 18th and 19th. And more dates, TBA. And also, not to keep promoting, sorry guys, but I don't think we do this too much. We're not so bad. If you guys like us, you want to hear us just banter about whatever it is that we're talking about. We are watching documentaries. We're reading extra books. We're watching all the hot TV Netflix shows that you want to hear our commentary on and general life updates and gossip and ramblings. We do like really long Patreon episodes these days. We're doing maybe 90 minutes pretty often. Yeah, we aim to hit like 40 five to 50 minutes and we typically come in around 125. (laughs) So if you're like, I've got a big car ride coming up, I'm bored at my desk job and you're looking for a little Thursday afternoon treat every Thursday afternoon, 6 p.m. EST. And we'd love to see you there. We're also always open to hearing what you guys want us to talk about. Any non-memoir specific content, it goes on the Patreon. Totally. Claire, if you were to write a memoir, back to memoir specific content, if you were to write a memoir, what would you title last week's chapter? I don't have a couch, so my life is a bit in limbo. So I guess this week was limbo. You know how I famously say home is where the TV is? <laughs> yeah, it turns out home is actually where the couch is. Well, I have a TV, so I do feel at home, but I don't feel comfortable in that home. But I'm getting a couch next week, and you're never going to see me again. Aww. I hope it keeps raining every Saturday for the rest of my life so that I never have to leave my house and I can watch TV forever. Don't say that. Well, I will, because I'm going to get a new couch soon, and I'm just going to sit there and watch TV. It turns out married life is mostly fighting about how big of a TV you can get. And we got like too big of a TV and it looks insane. And especially it looks insane because we have no furniture. That's why they call it the TV room. (laughs) I'm just standing up watching TV (laughs) on a TV that's like my own person sized. I don't know. I guess nothing's going on with me. I just feel like we've been reading a lot of books recently. Mostly I've been dedicated to my work and producing high-end content for you guys. Totally. Is that good enough for you? And then I go home and I stand up and I watch big TV. I was actually not sure. I don't know how to turn it on. So I like have to hold my laptop in my hand. (laughs) I just stand there and I watch TV on my laptop in front of my big TV. (laughs) Me? I've been working hard and watching TV standing up. (laughs) Cool. What about you, Ashley? If you were a celebrity and last week was a memoir, what would you chapter it? I would call it Ugly Girls Can Have a Nice Time Too. (laughs) Hard disagree. (gasps) I have been like in the midst of just the deepest, ugliest girl in the world attack. I feel like I've been breaking out so much worse than I ever have in like the last like 11 years. It's so crazy. I just feel like my skin has been so bad and I've been feeling so bad about myself and what I look like. And I feel like whenever I'm having like a really bad ugliest girl in the world attack, I'm like, you just have to go in a hole until you feel better. But I'm like, no, if the ugliest girl in the world attack is going to last, I don't know, we're going on like 45 days now. I have to just keep living my life. (laughs) I have to be a regular girl who skews ugly. You guys know what just happened to me? What? We got to the studio and I just went, oh my God, I just saw a girl who I thought was like an uglier version of me, but it was me. And Ashley goes, I know what picture you're talking about. I know who uploaded that picture. (laughs) And she was like talking about how we're like weirdly ugly I looked in that photo and the I do look so weirdly ugly but the way she was describing it was not like she was like you look so angular and sucked out and dead like and I was like I look bad but I wouldn't say those are the descriptors and then I kept scrolling through the carousel and there was another even worse photo of me <laughs> that Ashley had already seen it's so ugly of me and I am in the back do you know when they find a figure in the back of a painting that they didn't know was there because it's so dirty? I look like I was photoshopped in from the Blair Witch Project. I've never seen an uglier photo of me. And I wasn't even, I'd already thought I had just one minute earlier seen the ugliest photo of me. But I'm rocking and rolling. It didn't even set me <laughs> back that bad. 
Can I clarify that I wasn't like, oh my God, you're so ugly and No, but it felt good I to hear you like say it. I was like confirming because sometimes when you see a really ugly photo of yourself, there is like a certain point when someone being like, no, you actually look so beautiful is just condescending. Or when they go, that's how you look all the time. And I'm like, well, that's it for me then. <laughs> and it is not in line with what you look like in person to me. So I felt like it was more validating and supportive to tell you how ugly you looked. I really appreciated it. But I just, the joke is that this photo where I thought I looked so ugly wasn't even the half of it. I hadn't even stumbled upon the depth of which this fucked up face can plummet in terms of hotness. I'm like not even lit the way other people are. Like I like look like I'm haunting them. I look like it follows. <laughs> I look so much like the sister from Crip Keeper, who is kind of my celebrity twin. But this time I look like her in essence, not just in face sculpture. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> anyway, I guess I'm not the ugliest girl in the world. <laughs> Bingo bongo. <laughs> there was a detour. You guys, this is one of those books where we're like, is there anything else we can talk about? Well, should we get into the memoir of a very beautiful person who is kind of annoying? Please. I will say, I think the media is pretty mean to Jada. She is cringe. But the thing is, you can't make fun of her. Because you know that saying, I am cringe, but I am free? Yeah. She is not free. Yes. And that's why I don't think it's fair to make fun of how cringe she is. Like, she is still trapped by her own demons in a lot of ways. And that's why there are certain passages from this book that are, like, you can't help but laugh. But I do think my overall takeaway from this book is that I, like, do want the best for her. And I, like, want her to get to the bottom of this self-discovery journey that she is on and that she thinks that she's at the bottom of. But she is definitely not. I agree. I don't hate Jada. She's doing the most. Somehow this got way more complicated than it needed to be. She like won't stop sprinting in circles around the emotional truth, but she like thinks that she arrived at the emotional truth. And I'm like, you won't stop orbiting. You must stop. Anyway, in a journey of not reaching the center of anything, the dedication in this book is to my daughter and your daughters too, to my sons and your sons as well. Like she won't not deflect by like asking you a question back. I also want to talk about the literal physicality of this book and the print. It is dense and it is colorful. Yeah. Like every chapter has a full red page, which I guess is a nod to the red table talk. I love actually holistic branding. All things are branded. And at the end of each chapter, which is like they're each 20 pages long. There's like 20 chapters. It's a 400 page book. There's like a insert where she like discusses her therapy journey. It started us out with a quote and then she like sums up the yeah the therapized analysis of the chapter she just shared with you. And then she like makes it about you. And then she's like, here's the thing you can do. I hate when they give you like therapy journal homework in a memoir. It is a really big pet peeve of mine because while I do enjoy when I like learn something about myself through reading someone else's story, I don't like when they try to make me. Because I am like, well, I am here to learn about you. And sometimes there are lessons that can be like drawn throughout. Like there are obviously many parallels between us. We all live as humans on this earth. But I don't like need her asking me the questions her therapist asked her. Also, I want to talk about why she wrote this book. So in the author's note, in the prologue, The Heroine's Journey, she starts off a cliff. And what I mean by that is around her 40th year of life, her depression had gotten so bad that she was sincerely considering suicide and like preparing how she would kill herself and make it look like an accident. When luckily her son, Jaden, was like, hey, my friend's dad just did an ayahuasca ceremony. Have you ever heard of this? You should try it. I know you love self-discovery. And this ayahuasca ceremony after years of therapy and all these different types of self-help seems to have finally rid her of specifically her suicidal tendencies. However, she says, this is the book of the self-discovery of the journey that I've been on. And she writes it because one of the biggest lessons I've learned, which is the main reason I wrote this book, is how important it is to share our journeys to self-worth. And I think touching on what you just said, it's funny, you can even see it here. I think there's something about Jada where she wants to share her journey with you. And I think because she has come from such like humble beginnings and had such intense trauma in her childhood to now going on to be so successful, so wealthy, having so many privileges, she's like deeply out of touch in this way where she's like doing so much and then also being like, and you're just like me. And it's too much. Yeah. And even in this book, to bring it back to what we were saying, she's like, here's my journey, which is one thing. And then also be like, and here's how to fix your journey too. Not that she's saying I'll fix your journey, but it's like, 
The way that in between each densely written chapter is a densely written insert page of like a summation, an analysis, a homework, a riddle, a quote, a thought, a meditation, a prayer, and for you, homework. It's like, it's just so much all the time. And the thing is, there are things in this book that she just is either not ready to be honest about or not willing to be honest about, but she won't move past them. She just dances around them and it makes like a deeply convoluted chunk of this book. There are so many pieces of it where I'm like, I don't know if you won't admit this or if you have like decided to keep this to yourself as like a statement. But to write about it in a way that you think is still giving part of the story actually just makes this like a very frustrating piece. There's something about when you put yourself in the position of I'm on the other side of it and I'm giving this to you now to help you that like puts you in that self-deemed kind of mentor position that I personally have a lot of trouble with. I call it the Demi Lovato disease. Yeah. And you see it in celebrities, but I think you see it a lot in influencers too, who are like, I was actually so depressed for the last two months. I've never been more depressed, but for the first time in my life, I'm genuinely happy. And everything I'm doing now is to make me really, really happy. And then in two years, they're like, okay, honestly, the last two years have been the lowest times of my life. I've never actually felt joy, but now I figured it out. They're like, okay, I was being totally honest last time. Last time I was actually really down and out and I was lying about it. But this time I do think there's something to be said for when you feel you've gotten to the end of something just sitting in it instead of immediately pushing it back out. Yeah, I think that there's like a lot of space to grow once you have gotten to where you think your journey is comfortable and then letting that soak in. Yeah, there's like something you said about settling and just checking your work. Yeah. And I think like that's what's so shocking about Jada's life. I think my empathy towards her comes from this fact where I go, oh my God, it's just been so go, go, go. I don't think you've ever had a minute to sit and look at it. And that's why it's so funny. She's on these self-discovery journeys all the time. And you're like, I actually think you would benefit from just a couple weekends at home. Yeah. Like every time she has time to take a break, she'll like go, where was she? Like Vietnam? (laughs) Crazy. So we opened with my grandmother's garden. She spent a lot of time living with her grandparents and her mom. Her grandfather was a doctor and her grandmother was a social worker. And they had like a nice house in Baltimore where the mom between relationships would often move back in and they had kind of an apartment of their own within the house. Her mom and dad got married very briefly. They were married for about a year because her mom got pregnant at 17 years old and was given the options of that man marries you and you have this baby. We help you get an abortion or we help you put it up for adoption. Yes. So her parents did get married. It didn't last very long. At the time, her dad struggled with substance abuse and was abusive. And her mom, I think, also abused substances, but wasn't in a dire place yet. Yeah. So she was raised in this house that was in a primarily upper middle class white neighborhood. As we said, her grandfather was like not just a doctor, but he was the head of anesthesiology at a hospital. He was very well respected. Her grandmother was incredibly well respected. She had studied at Howard and she taught sex ed in Baltimore schools. Because she had been forced to have a baby when she was 13 years old because Jada tells the story that she'd been with a man and she says she's not even sure if her grandma knew at 13 that she had had intercourse. And so it became very important to her to teach sex education to kids because she's like, if you are going to be young and pregnant, you should at least know that that happened. Yeah, she said knowledge is what will save you. She also is always quick and instilling in Jada that you need to always have your own money how you do one thing is how you do everything. And her grandmother said it's so incredible. She would take her to the Universal Life Church. Her grandmother had studied in India. She was a big believer in studying every religion that was available to you, even though they themselves did not go to church, which was quite rare for like a black family back in the 70s. And they were all about just like learning about every way of the world. She's like, you have to understand everybody's culture and religion and be able to talk to anybody and find common ground. She kept a gorgeous garden and she loved Jada. Like Jada was so deeply loved by both sets of her grandparents who put a lot of work into making sure she was educated and cultured and just cared for all the time. One thing that I found very interesting about this book is that she always refers to people by their first names. And it was like a little bit hard for me to follow who was who in the beginning because I feel like I'm very used to just getting the name that you called them. Yeah. Because she says she called her mom, Mommy, but she often refers to her as Adrian. And then I was like, which one is Adrian? Oh, Mommy. Mm-hmm. And then Marion is her grandmother. And sometimes she'll say my grandmother. Sometimes she'll say Marion. I do think that that is like an interesting choice, especially using first names for things like that. Like how often do you say your mom's first name out loud? Never. Yeah. She was just very loved. They put her in classes. Grandmother believed I was going to do something in this world. She would say, Angel Pie, you are special. 
In remembering this period, I often ask myself, what was the thing she saw in me that made her say this? I'm not sure, but she said it enough that I believed her. She says this somewhere else too. I think her other grandfather's like, you are special. And she's like, how did they know I was going to go on to be famous? And I'm like, I do actually think that that's just like a thing grandparents say. Especially because she was like very interested in performing arts. She was always putting herself out there, writing and directing plays for her cousins. She ended up going to the Baltimore School of the Arts for high school, which was like the high school from fame, she says. So I do think that if you have someone who's on a performance trajectory, it's not like crazy to be like, you're special. (laughs) Oh, she was ultimately married in the Universal Life Church, but where they would go every week was the meetings of the Ethical Society. Okay. That's where they're taking every Sunday where they would hear speeches on ethics and different religions and different ways to be in the world. Teachings of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and other faiths. The histories and the cultural practices of their followers. It's very interesting. She gives her mom a lot of credit for never talking shit about her dad, even though he was very much not a part of her life. Like at one point, I think when she was seven or something, he was just like, I actually don't really have it in me to be a father and didn't speak to her for another 20 years. I don't know if they didn't speak or if it was just like understood that he would never be relied upon yeah, or expected to show up. I think they had like very minimal contact. But she goes out and visits him in California. It's a little unclear, I think, what their relationship was fully. She also talks about her relationship with her mom. Her mother was 18 when she had her. So she was very young. And a lot of her childhood was by herself if she wasn't with her grandparents because her mom was a woman in her 20s who was single and wanted to go out. And she says she has so many memories of like watching her mom get all dressed up to go out with her friends and be like, it's not your business where I'm going. And that she saw her more as a big sister and that this loneliness instilled in her a lot of fear that there was like no security at home. Like the home was not necessarily a safe place because nobody was there watching her. And when she was little, it was nerve wracking. But as she got older, it became all this free time that she could kind of go and do whatever she wanted and put herself in dangerous situations. So those were her two parents. Her dad was not in the picture. And her mom was a nurse who worked like 12 hour night shifts and was often gone and was just like a young person trying to figure it out and make ends meet and struggled. When I go in search of the origins of my broken heart, it is the sense of not being a priority to the two people who gave me life that creates a fracture in my feeling of worth. So then her mom marries a man named Tony. He becomes her first stepfather. And she actually really loves him. She says he was an incredible stepfather. They move to another part of town where they're now in a black neighborhood. They quickly get to move to like a nice home where she has her own room. And she says she remembers going in there and being like, wow, this is amazing. Like, this is the dream childhood bedroom. Tony was a very smart lawyer who was quickly like making a name for himself, both as a public defender and a private attorney. And he treated her like a full daughter. He took care of her often because her mom was working these overnight shifts. It was just the two of them. They would go on road trips together. He would bring her into work. He taught her everything that he could. He was a really good father to her. She also has her first like major brush with performing at this point. At school, she performs as Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. And at one point, she forgets one of the songs and like invites the whole audience to join in. And it becomes this magical moment. And she's like, I knew that I had something. The fact that I like was able to create that moment instead of getting scared and running off stage. So she was learning to work hard from her two parents. And Tony's hustle was strong. Mommy's hustle was extra strong at this time. She became an RN. And though Tony and I didn't really know it yet, a full-blown, high-functioning heroin addict who was holding it all together. The part I saw, their determination and drive was a gift to me to witness because it revealed how discipline, self-confidence, and willpower can be a potent recipe for success. So then her grandmother passes away at the same time as the mom was not keeping her drug use a secret anymore and Tony leaves her. So Tony leaves like without much explanation to Jada. She doesn't really get into the breakup because I don't think she was that informed about the inner workings of the breakup. And I think what happened is the grandmother's death kind of triggered a worse spiral into the drug use, which then triggered the divorce. Right. And so then within like a short period, she loses this father figure and her grandma. And initially, Tony had said, like, you'll always be my daughter. And right after the divorce, they were still close. But unfortunately, as soon as he got a new girlfriend, the new girlfriend calls up Jada and says, find your real father and then hangs up. She harassed my mother and me endlessly until grandmother Shirley gave her a call. Shirley told this woman that she knew people in high places and that if she bothered us ever again, she would make her life miserable. We never heard from that woman again. But with that, I didn't hear from Tony either. Something inside me broke. My grief was oceanic. So I put it on a library shelf labeled unlovable and tried to leave it there for good. My 13th year was when my life changed drastically and when the Baltimore streets became my home, when I went in search of my power, sense of control, and love. Not every block of every street was a war zone, but there was nowhere you could go and not be on guard. After the double blows of my grandmother's death and Tony's departure, I was lost in state of mourning and in need of a new sense of safety. 
It was now apparent that Adrian was in the throes of her addiction and mostly unavailable, leaving me for all intents and purposes on my own. She talks about how in her neighborhood in Baltimore in the mid to late 80s, like drug selling really became the number one viable way for people to up their station in life. And it is just so interesting to see the way that both sets of grandparents came from these like white collar, impressive backgrounds. One grandfather's a lawyer. The other grandfather's a doctor. Both of their wives are educated members of society who do their best to be part of the community. I mean, more her maternal grandmother than her paternal grandmother, but they all come from these stable, steady, upper middle class homes. And yet both of her parents ended up addicted and struggling. And she then goes on and says, I was looking around and seeing how other people were making money. And the quickest way for anybody to make money or the number one way for people to make money was to become a drug dealer. So she, at the age of 14, becomes a hustler, which is what she calls drug dealing. Can I take a moment to share this small story? Sure. Of all the stories of Jada Pinkett Smith, and this is why you have to read the book or listen to our podcast on the book and not just trust the headlines because the headlines have ignored one of the most psychotic things I've ever heard from anybody. Get into it. So a boy drives up in a BMW and asks Jada if she wants to get in. And it's like this brand new, beautiful car. And her and her mom are on the stoop. And she's like, well, can I go? And her mom's like, I don't know. Who is that guy? And she's like, oh, he's just a friend. Didn't you say you wanted McDonald's? I'll go get you McDonald's with him. And so the mom goes, okay, fine. You can get me McDonald's. And then way home from McDonald's, go to the store and get me a Pepsi. That's crazy. Why would you not get a Coca-Cola from McDonald's? That is crazy. <laughs> It also turns out that that car was stolen and then they get into a really big car chase with cops. But that Pepsi thing was also crazy. I'm just sure the best thing about McDonald's is McDonald's Coke. Do you think they didn't have the recipe yet in the 80s? Like when did McDonald's Coke become so coveted? I just can't imagine not getting a Coke from McDonald's and instead getting a Pepsi from a bodega. Like on the way home from McDonald's. I'm like, I go to McDonald's for McDonald's Coke. I do that all the time. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Okay, so she becomes a heroin dealer. She picks a block because you can't pick a territory that someone else has. There's this area in Baltimore where there's only one way into this neighborhood, only one road. So no one even deals there. Like it's kind of a no man's land because it's so dangerous to like not have an exit really. And she's like, well, I'll take the area. And everyone's like, are you sure? And she's like, yeah, yeah, it'll be totally fine. And she starts dealing out of this apartment. So in this time of her teenage years, she is also going to the Baltimore School for Music and Arts. And this school, I have to tell you, the amount of talent that they're pushing out is insane. So many of our friends from this high school go on to make it really big in Hollywood, including, of course, her BFF, Tupac Shakur. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. And she also has a ton of day jobs and a ton of hobbies. She's like so popular. She has so many friends. She takes a whole chapter to go through and like list every single one of her close friends. And I'm like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> I get it. You could have just said I had a lot of friends. A lot of them like are in her life for a long time. Yeah. So she is going to school all day. She is taken under the tutelage wing of a lot of other hustlers in the neighborhood. And one of the number one things she learns is that you always have to lay low and always have an official job to explain where the money is coming from. She's also going to this prestigious school for acting where she is known as very talented. She's getting gigs here and there as an actress. She's also like a big rollerblader. She's always going to the skating rink. She's working, selling clothes. She's working all over the place. And she's dealing drugs. And she's always getting into dance battles. Can I say, I've seen headlines of her talking about Tupac's dick. But in this book, their relationship is never sexual. Maybe they like saw it in that friend way. But she doesn't talk about it in this book. No. So she says Tupac is like a brother to her. She says it's the first time she's ever felt a love with the opposite gender where it wasn't sexual. She also says that they bonded over the fact that they both came from like tough homes. But the difference was Tupac was like broke in a way that her family was not. And she was making all this money. So she would like make excuses to buy him stuff and just kind of like lie because he wouldn't take charity. But she'd be like, oh, I saw this jacket and it felt like it would look really cool on you. And she didn't want him to be a part of the drug dealing game because his mother had actually moved their family from New York City. So he was relatively new to the scene. He did not have enough credibility and trust built up within the community. And she was like, a lot of people were threatened by him because he was so naturally charismatic that he was seen as an alpha and therefore a threat to the other men. And like they just would not have taken him in the way that they took in Jada. It is really interesting how throughout their lives, it's this constant back and forth of like who's protecting who from the dangerous scene that they've like walked into. During our teen years, it wasn't really Pac's good looks that had grabbed you because his sculpted features and unforgettable handsomeness hadn't quite come in yet. What he did have, even in 10th grade, was pure unadulterated charisma that was out of this world. 
Can I say, she spends pages. If you went through this book and highlighted the amount of times that she just gushes about his talent, his good looks, his charisma, his everything. The way that they bandaged, the way that they understood each other, the way that they were soulmates. Yeah. Versus the way she talks about someone she was married to for like, I think more than two decades. I do get why Will was threatened. Yeah. At one point, she's like, Will is so talented. Kind of, she says that. She says, I don't find him to be the funniest person I've ever met. He's not always making me laugh, but when he does, I'm really laughing hard. And I was like, oof, as a man who I think would have at one point billed himself as a comedian, that's got a sting. So one of the things that her and Pac get along about is that they're both debaters and he really starts to teach her about like her black history. Pac, fiery and eloquent, delivered political sermons to me and John with particular attention to the plight of the black community. It was in these impromptu forums that I learned about the Black Panthers and teachers who shaped its ideology. Pac taught me so much about history I had never known, and he spoke about how that history continued to influence the systemic abuse of power in efforts to destroy Black communities. However, when she starts reading for herself, they would get into these back and forths because Pac and I had many intense and powerful debates about sexism within the civil rights movement and the Black power movement and the ridiculousness of how Black men, in fighting for their freedom and autonomy, had a very difficult time believing that their women deserve the same freedom and autonomy. This was always deeply disappointing to me, and Pac and I would go at it around the issue. Pac loved women, especially black women, but he had his hangups. I could go as hard as he could, but was more willing to give up my need to be right when he hit me with some potent truths. I can't say Pac gave up his need to be right so easily, but man, I knew how to set him down. It is tough to be like, we love to shoot the shit. The one thing we could never agree on is whether or not women deserved rights. And that is a theme that comes up a lot. And I will say later when he is found guilty of sexual assault, she's like, he would have never done that. But everything she says about him is about how they, to the end, were fighting about whether or not women were just bitches and hoes. And there's another scene where she goes to visit him at the prison and he just grabs her and kisses her. And when she goes, what are you doing? He's like, well, I've been in jail this whole time. I deserve it. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's weird. The blind eye that she puts to how she herself would describe him versus what she's like, it's impossible that he would do such a thing. So again, they're in this threesome. She has this boyfriend, John, Tupac, her. They're all best friends. Tupac eventually moves in with John. The three of them are just like these buddies and she is fucking heartbroken when one day out of nowhere with no warning, she gets a note in her locker from Tupac saying, I've moved out to California. She calls him. It turns out his family has moved him and they stay in touch. There's no really explanation as to why he moved. I kept waiting for like, I mean, I'm sure there was like some sort of family financial opportunity. I feel like if his family was like really struggling financially, I think that if there was an opportunity for a job in California, his parents would say, let's go. And at this point, he was still like 14 or 15. So you can't not go when your parents go unless you're Jaden Smith. So she's raking in cash because she is doing a pretty good job selling heroin in this like strange little neighborhood. But she does have a ton of like near death experiences and it starts to hit her and she has friends that are coming to her. She's five feet tall, flat and 95 pounds. And they keep being like, Jada, you have to stop. And everybody's a little bit freaked out by how involved she's getting. And her mom is like, are you going to college? And she's written off college. She doesn't get into Juilliard. And she goes, well, if I can't get into Juilliard, I'll go nowhere. And she's kind of just decided that her future is to stay in Baltimore and become a queen pin of drug dealing. And her friends are all like, this can only go of one way. It's just like a ticking time bomb. So there is a school that is obsessed with getting her to audition. And she's like, no, I didn't get into Juilliard. So I have no reason to go to college. And they keep coming. They keep trying to get her to come. It's like the North Carolina School of the Arts or something. The UNC School of the Arts in Winston-Salem. So her teacher is asking her to audition, but I think that it, she's like a shoe in if she does. It's funny how easy it is to buy into the fallacy that it's momentous turning points and grand choices that decide our course. Sometimes it can be one small action, even one taken by someone else nudging us this way or that way. That makes all the difference. And so she gives a lot of credit to all of her teachers at the Baltimore school that she went to for high school because they all believed in her. They all pushed her. This one teacher specifically insisted that she auditioned for this school that she didn't want to go to. And of course, spoiler alert, she ends up getting in and going. And it does kind of save her life and get her out of the Baltimore drug game. She was getting pushed out of the Baltimore drug game. So she gets jumped at one point and someone steals her entire stash and all of the money she had on her. So she goes from being like top of the world to essentially broke. And then on top of that, she owes all this back money to the person she buys from because she's had all of her products stolen and all of her cash stolen. So then now she owes him a favor and he goes, it's fine, don't worry about the money, but I need you to go reclaim some product that we left in this flooded basement. And she goes down there with a friend and they get stuck up at gunpoint. 
And it's just, there's a couple of situations back to back where she is held at gunpoint by people who are killers, like people who within weeks would go to jail or be arrested for murdering the next person that they stick up at gunpoint. Like one person she talks to and is like, why did you not kill me? And he's like, well, you were pretty. And she goes, I really believed him. I don't have a lot of self-love, but in that moment I thought, wow, I must be pretty pretty. I'm like, I guess I would believe it too. This line is funny. At one point, she gets held up at gunpoint. The first time when she gets held up at gunpoint, she just like pees herself. Yeah. And she goes, I was terrified as hell, pissy pants and all, but I can't help but talk shit. And then the next time she gets held up at gunpoint, she goes, I took a deep breath. I did not want to piss my pants this time. <laughs> Do you think you'd pee your pants? Oh, I pee my pants when I <laughs> laugh too hard. I mean, yeah. <laughs> So her mom finds a baggie that had drugs in it. And she's like, you don't understand. I don't do drugs. I just sell drugs. And her mom's like, you're going to college right now. Get the fuck out. (laughs) So she ends up going to UNC. And she only does one year. She has a really good year there. She's like, I get why it was super important for me to get out of Baltimore. Like, this was actually a really good call. But after one year, she's like, I actually learned how to act so good from that one year that I was ready for LA. She had already been in a movie called Cry Freedom with Denzel Washington. Her mom also supported her move out to L.A. I mean, she calls her mom and says, Hey, Ma, I don't think it makes sense for me to do three more years of college for acting. So you get two choices. I can go to law school and become a lawyer, or I could go to L.A. and see if I can really do this acting thing. Without hesitation, my mother answered, Hollywood it is. That's cool. I will say, I wonder if she thought she could just go to law school. In one of those situations, there's definitely three more years of school. Yeah, three plus even. Anyway, so she moves out to L.A., It was not quick for things to take off, but she gets in with some really big future superstars right away. So she talks a lot about at this point in time, it's like the late 80s, early 90s. What is it? 1990 exactly, actually, maybe? Yeah, she calls it the golden years of black Hollywood. And so there was all these black sitcoms going on and all these black comedians were getting their own TV shows, which meant that there was a lot of like, I mean, I don't want to say great roles for women, but has there ever been a time where there's like a ton of great roles for women? But There were roles. There were a lot of roles, more than you would think for black women. And it was like a great time for her to start in Hollywood. And there was all these like up and comers. I will say she's like this young upstart Dwayne Wayans. And I'm like, wasn't his dad already huge? No, I thought they were the first ones. And then like Uh, the other ones are the second generation. Okay, I mixed up my gens. Yeah, so she becomes friends with Keenan Ivory Wayans, who eventually like puts his brother on. And then they have kids who like become a whole generation of Wayanses. She becomes friends with Nia Long, Paula Jai Parker, Elise Neal, Halle Berry, Regina King, Tamala Jones, Tachina Arnold, Melinda Williams, Monica Calhoun, Nicole Ari Parker, who is a fan favorite from Sex and the City. You guys may know her from our Patreon reviews. Lila Roshan and Queen Latifah, who is, if you're listening, Queen. We would love a memoir from you. Yes. That's who I've decided I really want a memoir from. I would like that. So she becomes friends with Keenan Ivory Waynes really close. And he's making In Living Color. And she's like, you got to put me on that show. And he's like, just wait. And she does, I will say, have some very key pieces here about like, you can be friends with famous people. And that doesn't mean they're ready to put you on. Like you have to keep on working your ass off too. And like eventually they can like set the ducks in a row to help you out. But like, if you're not ready to help yourself, no one can put you on. And I think that that's something we see in comedy all the time with our friends, people just expecting someone to be like, okay, now it's your turn. But if you're not making it be your turn, and then as soon as someone opens a door, you're ready, you never get ready. Somebody can't build a project for you, but if you have a project you're working on, they can show it to somebody high up. Yeah. Keenan fully kept Jada out of jail. At one point, one of her friends from Baltimore is like, hey, I've been arrested for this thing. So I have some photos that I need you to doctor and then testify that I was hanging out with you. And she's like, yes. And then she's talking about it. And Keenan is like, that is full perjury. He's like, you will go to jail. And she's like, I don't know. I just have this thing where it's like ride or die. You do anything for your friends in the streets. Like you don't turn your back just because they went to jail. And he says, is he your friend if he's asking you to go to jail? That's like not a friendly thing to do. And I think this is really great perspective. He says, who of your friends would you ask to go to jail? And she's like, none. Okay. (laughs) I guess I'm not really his friend. He also gives her the advice to never do extra work. Too many people get stuck there. And then he also helps her get an agent, which I will say, contrary to everything she just said about how no one can put you on for you, getting an agent is one of those battles where when celebrities don't put it in their memoir, it enrages me because I'm like, that's the tricky part. They're like, You know, next thing I knew, I was out there with my agent going on every audition in the world. It was so hard. I think Busy Phillips kind of had that. And I'm like, well, how did you get the agent? Yeah. That is literally the hardest. Me and Ashley got agents last year. Yeah. We're in year three of this podcast. And you're like eight of doing comedy. 
I'm just going to read the exact quote about other people can't put you on because the way she does this is so deeply Jada. And that is like the fluff of this book. So she says, everybody thinks that once you've met famous people that they should put you on. What I was learning was that if you heed the lessons successful people have to offer you and stay on your game, the successful people around you will see your effort and want to give you assists. Nobody can do it for you and no one is truly inspired to help you in a real way if you're not willing to help yourself, nor should they. To be successful takes so much more than who you know. Pretty succinct, pretty to the point, great advice. Then she goes into like two paragraphs about how you can see this exact phenomenon in baby turtles as well. And I'm like, I don't know that you needed to like illustrate the life cycle of a baby turtle in order for us to get what you were talking about. I literally understood you. (laughs) I like understand how humans interact and like human ambition in business way better than I understand baby turtle ambition. Like, what was that for? (laughs) It isn't in the next pages. Anyway, then Keenan helped me get an agent by calling the agent and saying that I should take her on. So she goes with Nancy Rainford, who I think is still her agent to this day who had also taken on Michael Rapoport? Yikes. So Nancy is a black agent who fights for her. Nancy was fierce, smart, and fearless. I love that about her. I would often hang out in her very small office and watch how she conducted business over the phone. Whenever somebody underpaid for Jada, she would just say no and hang up and go, don't worry, they'll call back in 20 minutes. She understood early that although lots of work was available for black talent, the dealmakers loved to lowball us. Nancy, in effect, taught me how to walk away from deals that didn't represent my worth. It's a lesson I've held on to throughout my career. More than that, she showed me how the game was played behind the curtain. I find that very interesting. Yeah, she said she would just like sit in Nancy's office and watch her work. And she like developed a really good understanding of the back end of the business, which I think is extremely valuable. So then things start happening. She's like worried for a while that all she's getting commercials and little bit pieces. Then she starts getting roles on True Colors, Doogie Howser, 21 Jump Street, Moe's World. She gets actually cast in this pilot where she's going to play a 12-year-old girl. And it's going to go to series and her agent's like, amazing. You got it. You finally got like the star of a series role. She acts like she was out there hustling out. She's like, I had three different jobs. But then by the time she's 19, she's a full fledged regular on a different world. And she had already been in Boys in the Hood. So like she was getting things kind of right away. She turns down this opportunity to be the star of a preteen show, which is crazy that she could play 12. But I guess she was so petite. But she's like, something better is coming for me. And then she gets an opportunity to audition for a role in... In a different world for Debbie Allen. Who was her hero. She was obsessed with her. And she like just gets to the audition. Is like, I'm sorry, you're my biggest inspiration. And Debbie's like, well, why don't you tell me about yourself? And so she starts talking about her life. She says her whole life story. And Debbie goes, you're not going to get this role. I'm going to make you a series regular and I'm going to write a role based on your life. And she's like, holy shit. So she, one year in, has this recurring role on this hit TV show. She's doing amazing. She's getting little acting bits and uh, movies. She has all these friends. She's part of this like incredibly star-studded group of young black Hollywood friends. She's hanging out with Eddie Murphy. She's hanging out with everybody. At one point, she does audition for a role on Fresh Prince and doesn't get it, but she like interacts with Will Smith briefly in the hallway. She just feels the need to foreshadow that moment because in case you don't know who she ends up married to. In a world where young black artists were at one time invisible, it felt as if we were on our way to the promised land and I experienced it alongside the cast and crew of a predominantly black production of A Different World. So she is doing great. She like gets a fancy apartment. It is haunted, but she loves it. (laughs) The mentality for me was if you work hard, then you get to play hard. Play hard was my real deal mantra. And it wasn't just drinking, getting fucked up. It was also men. The dudes were abundant everywhere. I was young, uninhibited and bold. And because of my success and having a lot of eyes on me, I felt entitled to reap the benefits. Good for you. She also still talks about how she has a rough around the edges energy that she just like cannot shake and does not want to shake. And it may be a little bit of her trauma coming out. So she'll be out dancing and sometimes somebody will be in her way and she will snap in a minute and be like, fuck you. And she's drinking bottles of wine and she can out drink everybody. She's 90 pounds and drinking with the best of them and still like going. And her friends are often having to drag her out of a club after she fights. And she's kind of like, maybe there's a problem here, but we'll talk about it later. She also mentions that people kept telling her to like lose her Baltimore accent. And she'd be like, no. And then years later, she'd run into them and they'd be like, you did do what I said. And she's like, ha ha. Another name that she continuously named drops throughout this book, like the weirdest person who continues to pop up in this book for me, is that she's obsessed with talking about her like early days friendship with Caesar Milan. He's like one of her closest friends. Okay, so Caesar Milan is like a dog whispering hero, like a world renowned dog trainer. My mom like mailed me like four Caesar Milan books when I got Bug, and Bug was like, "I'll shit on those books." I would love to see Caesar Milan and Bug go head to head. 
So she has Rottweilers and she takes them to Cesar Milan and she's like, we got along right away. Everyone said, don't go to the Mexican neighborhoods because you'll get shot. But I went anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and we became friends because he's ambitious. And she's like, he really taught me about being ambitious because you would say dog trainer. There's going to be a pretty low ceiling on that. No. And he said, no, <laughs> I will take over the world. He goes, I'm going to internationally become the most famous dog trainer of all time. And she said, Caesar, you don't even speak English. He learns English and they're still best friends to this day. And he's always getting her new dogs. No, you know, the craziest thing is at one point she's like, I was back with my friend Caesar because Will had just gotten two baby puppy Rottweilers as a gift from David Letterman. <laughs> and I'm like, that is an insane gift to give somebody. A dog is like an undertaking. You don't just hand out dos puppies. Can I say the way famous people have dogs is so fucking weird to me. They're always just like loosey goosey getting more dogs. And I'm like, what happened to the original dogs? Like, what is the lifespan of a famous person's dog? I'm extremely stressed about it. I guess when you have that much property, maybe they all roam free like wild things. Maybe. Later, Willow has a tarantula and a spider and then Jada gets into snakes and they get a bunch of snakes. And I'm like, I guess if I had a giant mansion and my snakes could have their own house, I'd be like, yeah, you could get snakes. But the idea of a snake being within my home, no. So she is bunking around. She's like, I don't even see a point in having a boyfriend because I'm so busy. So I just need like some hotties to entertain me. She also, much like Patrick Stewart, comes out as not gay in this book. Yeah. She says there's been a lot of rumors that I am gay. And back in the day, I had a couple of sexual experiences with women, only to realize that when it comes to sex, I love men. So there you have it. But she wishes that everyone has the opportunity to like try it out. She's like, some people don't even orgasm, which is so fucked. That is fucked. It is fucked. <laughs> Anyway, so Tupac is kind of mad at her because she like always has a different guy and she's like, you're always falling in love with a different girl. What the fuck? And he's like, I have respect for women who respect themselves. But if you a hoe, I'm going to treat you like one. So they get into a huge fight again about what it means to be a hoe. Afterwards, she had an epiphany that Pac and her were actually arguing about the right to feel loved. We thought we were arguing about the semantics of how men and women disrespect each other. But underneath that was his point that black men deserve love and not just because they're famous and got money. And my point was that black women deserve love, even if they don't live up to the idealized vision imposed on them. So this is like one of the first examples of her like running in circles to like self-actualize a point that is entirely missing the point. It is crazy to be like when you say that you're not going to respect women who don't deserve respect. And I say, but you should. And then I see that we actually both have equal points. Yeah. She is somebody who has some deeply held convictions that she is willing to meet you in the middle on. <laughs> and those are always respecting women. She meets Easy E from um, NWA. And immediately she's like, why don't you respect women? And he goes, did you know that I host a festival for kids? And she thought, well, how am I going to fight him on that? <laughs> so they become friends. And then she goes, you know, Easy's real passion and focus was educating young people about business and entrepreneurship. And in that way, she was like, I, if he doesn't respect women, he's got other good qualities. So they join forces and become friends. So she starts trying to understand confidence, self-worth, etc. She says confidence can help build self-worth, but it can't substitute self-love. And it would take me a lot of years to unravel the difference between having confidence in some areas of my life, performing, making money and thriving in survival mode, and having a healthy sense of self-worth. She starts to realize that success won't fix the holes within herself. Like she thought she could build herself up with the trappings of fame, but she still feels a bit empty. And that is where her and Tupac come back together. They're both becoming very successful in their respective fields, but they're both still left wanting. And it's hard for her to explain this to people back home. She goes back home to Baltimore and literally she visits her own grandmother and her grandmother invites everybody from the neighborhood to come get her autograph when she was just wanted to be normal at her grandma's house. And she's like, it's hard because the people who know me the best are the people from back home. And those are the people I can't be honest with right now because they can't fathom how all this fame and money has not fixed the problems. No matter how much I try to explain to others that success wasn't fixing my life the way I thought it would, that didn't seem possible or real to them. And I got that because it didn't seem possible to, or real to me either. So Tupac gets her her first movie role. He wants to do this movie with her called Menace to Society. And so she gets Debbie Allen to like adjust her a different world schedule around the shooting of this movie. She goes, who knew that my first Hollywood film ever would be starring next to Tupac in a job he put me on? That doesn't seem that crazy. It's not crazy, but it's also funny. She's like, listen, nobody will ever put you on. But he specifically was like, it's going to be Jada. 
And they were like, she's not big enough to star in this movie. And he insists. He's like, I'll only do it if she does it with me. And then as soon as they hire her, he's like, well, I'm out. <laughs> but she's already agreed to it. She's already gotten the, a different world schedule changed. And she wanted to quit. She was like, if I, I'm not doing it without you. And he goes, don't be stupid. This is like a really big deal. Yeah. And it was. So she's shooting a movie in North Carolina. And her friend is like, hey, Will Smith is shooting a movie in Atlanta. And he wants to come out and talk to you. And so she's like, mm, okay. And he comes out and asks her to be his girlfriend on Fresh Prince. And she's like, I'm not going back to TV. And they're like, you can be big in TV and in film now. And she's like, not me, though. I can't. So she and Will Smith kind of become friends at this point. They're like friendly. They're both in the same circles. So they see each other at parties all the time. And again, back to her career, she doesn't want to go back to TV People are giving her the advice that, listen, take the TV, it's steady work, and you can't guarantee that there's always going to be a role for a black woman in Hollywood. And she goes, I'll take my chances. I'll see how it goes. I want to be a film star. And she does it. She's in a ton of stuff. Jason's Lyric is her next big one. The hairdresser on that set, Maxine, ends up being one of her best friends. So she is doing really well. Like Her career has never been better. She has a lot of really good friends. But then on her 21st birthday, she like really falls into the depths of depression. And it's the first time she's ever felt suicidal. And she calls her mom and is like, mom, you have to come out here. I don't know what to do. I'm scared to be alone. She has people come and be with her constantly. Her mom comes out for two weeks. And then afterwards, she finally meets with a psychiatrist who puts her on Prozac and then gets her into therapy. And she realizes that despite fame, she maybe needs to like keep one foot in Hollywood and fulfill her life a different way. So she buys a farmhouse in Baltimore and she starts renovating it. And she thinks maybe she wants to like keep doing film as much as possible, but like have a quiet and stable life in Baltimore. It required a lot of renovation, but the plan was for me to move back home. I needed some peace. I needed some quiet. I needed to breathe. Also, while she's at this house in Baltimore, Will Smith calls her at one point and she's talking to him on the phone. And her mom is like, why are you talking to Will Smith on the phone? And she's like, I don't know. He's my friend. And Jada's mom is like, you don't need to have married man friends. This feels inappropriate. And so she's like, oh, well, you can't call me anymore. Sorry. So she hangs up on him. Professionally, I barely skipped a beat. The survivor in me knew better than to give any notice of my troubles so that I was not deemed unreliable for work. In 1994, on any given week, I was on the merry-go-round, either doing publicity for a crop of films released that year or in the middle of shooting other projects. She did a low-down Dirty Shame, Tales from the Crypt, Demon Night. She also directed a music video for Gerald Levert, How Many Times?, she also dates like kind of a lunatic in 1994 that she doesn't name, but do we, should I look up who it is? Yeah. Wesley Snipes? Oh my God. Potentially. She dates the psycho who tries to buy her off and she keeps saying, I don't want to date right now. I don't want to date right now. He offers to pay $700,000 on the farmhouse so she can get it renovated. And she's like, absolutely not. I know that money comes with chains. And then they have a situation where she's getting more and more scared of how like outbursty he gets and how controlling and how mad he gets when she talks to anybody else and he doesn't know where she is. This is the thing about like one of her patterns is that she'll like see a lot of red flags but be like, well, I'm just hanging out. Yeah, she specifically says like, I thought maybe there could be something good there. Even though she was like literally afraid to be around him and also had already told him she wouldn't date. So anyway, they're going to one of his houses in the middle of nowhere and he goes berserk and she jumps out of the moving car, runs into his house, has to grab a knife. He has her trapped there and is like, where are you going to go? And then luckily, before it like gets any scarier or more dangerous, one of his friends runs in and like calms him down. And the next day she's like, oh, I have to go to a job. So I told you I have to go meet up with Spike Lee. So she gets on a plane and just never sees him again. So at this point, also, Tupac is attacked. He's shot several times, including in like a very serious groin injury. And this is also when he's supposed to be appearing in court for a sexual assault case. So this is what she says about that. I was really excited about the album and happy for him. Then, as the conversation turned to his latest legal concerns, Pac looked at me with sincere intensity and said, I need to explain to you what happened, how I caught this case. He didn't get very far into the story before I stopped him, holding up my hand and looking at him with the same intensity. Listen, I don't need to hear the details. All I know is if Tupac Amaru Shakur is ever in a room with any girl under any circumstance, she should always feel safe, no matter what. I braced myself for an intense rebuttal, not that he disagreed with that belief, but that because you never knew which Pac was going to show up on any given day. It's just so contradictory to be like, you never know what version of himself he's going to be, but he's never going to be a version of himself that hates women, except for when he's arguing with me about how he hates women. We did rough Googles of the case. He was absolutely convicted guilty of assault in the 90s. And people don't even convict men of assault now. 
Anyway, so she's going through it. He's down and out, but it brings them together. She goes and takes care of him. And then ultimately he is convicted and she goes and visits him in jail a lot. And he really finds it important that she is standing by him in this time when everyone has abandoned him. The most potent love language for me has always been the language of protection. And it's always been important for me to feel protected by those I love and to be able to protect them in return. You show up for each other even when doing so comes at a cost. So when he was sent to jail, a lot of people asked her to like disavow him, to stop standing in solidarity with him. And she's like, I will not turn my back on you. I'll always have your back. I was alive back then, but I was born in 92 and this is what, 95. So I wasn't hyper aware of what was going on in the rap community and in the legal findings of sexual assault cases. Totally. I'm not going to beat myself up too much about it. I'm sorry if you're out there being like, how do you not know your history? But I was just a baby. (laughs) (laughs) I do wonder what then happened because while he was in jail, he released his next album, Me Against the World. And I know that his song, Dear Mama, went number one and it seems he was received positively yeah as his album was a hit and so i do wonder how society then felt about him after that album because i think people were like okay women specifically don't love that he's a convicted assaulter right but i think a lot of people kind of forgave we forgive we forget yeah especially forget and then i'm not saying it shouldn't be forgotten like i mean he's literally dead so like i don't know I guess he did his time. He did his crime, paid his time. But yeah, I I mean, I was looking up some information on it. And I think a lot of people believe that he was set up as well. So that is one prevailing belief. Anyway, because Jada is standing by him and he really values this loyalty, he tries to marry her. (laughs) I will say that I also then saw he was married to somebody else while he was in this jail too. Well, okay. So he really wanted a jail life. And she was basically like, are you saying that you like love me and want me to be there for you while you're in jail? Or do you need conjugal visits as well? He's like, you got to come conj me. And she's like, oh, then no. And I will say her like dissonance during this section, I found very frustrating because it is not like a respect. Do you know what I mean? Like it's hard to read someone not understanding the way they're like being used in this situation. Here's what I know. Pac wanted me as a wife to get him through his jail sentence, but not for a lifetime. He didn't know that then, not while he was behind bars. But I promise you, once he got out of jail, he was glad he didn't marry me. I think she like still thinks it was like a flattering thing that came from a place of like deep friendship and love. But I think that he was just like, who's a girl? Meanwhile, he just does find someone else to marry like immediately after because he's only in jail for like eight or nine months. And he like proposed to two people. So this is while he was in Rikers awaiting trial. He couldn't reach the three million dollar bail, which she then tried to help him with. But on February 8th, he was sentenced in court to serve 18 months to four and a half years. And then on that Valentine's Day, so six days later, Will and his wife, Cherie, officially file for divorce. Immediately, he calls her and says, what's up? Where are you? Baltimore, I told him. You seeing anybody? I paused. Um, no. Good, Will said. You seeing me now? Ooh, I thought that's a bold approach. And nobody had ever stepped to me like that. My reaction was a schoolgirl laugh. Yeah, so that's how their, like, courtship began. And then the next page, she says, I have to be honest, me falling for Will Smith was very unexpected for me. And she just starts talking about how much she was in love with him. And it just does not resonate with any, like, connection to me. She just, like, decided to be in love with Will Smith. I think she was going through a really bad time in her life. And he caught her as she was falling. And then she, like, rationalizes it as falling head over heels in love. Everything has been a blur from our first jaunt that began, where are we going? You'll see, pack a bag. Oh, a private jet. And then parentheses, one of the most obnoxious parentheses I think we have read to date in our three years of Celebrity Memoir Book Club. This was before everybody in Hollywood had to have their own private airplane on standby for spur of the moment weekends in paradise. Can you imagine being like, well, he impressed me on our first date with a private jet. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. This was back when that was kind of impressive. (laughs) Okay, Jada. To this day, no one's taking me on a private jet date. So I guess I'm trash. (laughs) I love that she is so worried that the people who are reading this are really going to think that that's like not something to be impressed by. And not because you like are above material wealth, but because you're like, everybody has a private jet. That's how we're all going on a first date. Once again, I do feel for her and I like her, but she digs herself into these holes where she's talking about how deep Will Smith is. She's like, you don't This understand. is the worst thing I've ever heard read it. <laughs> she's talking about how cheerful he is and how she equated cheerful with not deep, but it turns out he is like an absolute thinker. She goes, on our first date, we were sitting at a restaurant having a fierce debate over dinner. Will pointed to his glass, a visual component to understand perception. You see that glass? 
It's right from where you're sitting. He waited for me to agree, and I did. But from where I'm sitting, it's on my left. I had never thought about things that way at the tender age of 23. The point he was conveying was that learning to understand someone else's perception by putting yourself in their position is a powerful skill. Bitch! Yeah, I have to read the next sentence. Nobody around me at the time was thinking that deeply. I'm sorry. I can't believe what she's fallen for. Mirror images? (laughs) Nobody has ever in her entire life been like, sometimes when you argue with someone, it's because you think about things different. (sighs) She's also just very impressed by him. He broke the rules so effortlessly and it would set him in a league of his own. He could sometimes, only sometimes, be hilariously silly. (laughs) I did not find him as consistently funny as others, but when he did make me laugh, he knew it was genuine and made a sport out of having me literally rolling on the floor. A few months after I'd really fallen for Will, he called to announce that Shuri wanted to put the divorce aside and try to reconcile. My heart crashed. He spent two weeks trying to reconcile with Shuri before he called Jada again and was like, never mind, actually you. And I will say this actually to me tells the story of how their relationship went on for so long because I feel like she went in not knowing what to expect. She like liked being showered with gifts and experiences. And he did like bullseye for her. He bullseyed for her. She like needed support at that time. And then when he yanked the carpet out from under her, I feel like she was like, no, I must have you. Like, I think she was like, I don't know. This is kind of interesting. There are a couple moments in this early courtship before their hand is tied where he leaves her or will straight up say the thing you've done, I will leave. She is on the defensive quite often. There seems like there's a real sense of she's in it, but he could leave at any moment. Right. So it feels like you understand why she's clinging to it, even if I don't know if it ever feels like there's like a deep love there yeah so they get into a fight on thanksgiving because he's talking to his son's other grandmother on the phone and jada gets upset about this which is like it's immature and i get it's tricky when you marry someone with a kid they have this whole other family that is important but still the way he deals with it is he just goes i'm not talking to you about this i actually don't want to talk to you at all and he goes to sit outside by the pool and she's like it makes it seem like he's done with me forever she goes this was me trying to play tough but the truth of the matter was i'm scared he's going to call everything off and leave me again Now in shame and self-recrimination, I can't believe how much I showed my ass in full disrespect of Will trying to keep things peaceful and smooth in an already difficult situation. To me, this is like a deeply manipulative relationship where like he can constantly be like, you actually did something so wrong and I will not talk you through it. Like you have to win me back. And then she puts it on herself to win him back. And this time she does something genuinely insane. She gets drunk, climbs up to the roof of this house they're staying at, jumps off the roof into the pool and screams, I love you, Will. And he like picks her up out of the pool and wraps her in a towel and is like, you're crazy. And I love that. This was us. And this night was a preview of the next damn near three decades of our life together, living on edges of our own making and driving each other absolutely crazy. Sometimes joyfully and some other times with great dot, 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 dislike. I mean, this is to me the picture of a deeply toxic relationship. So Pac gets out of jail because Suge Knight and Death Row Records put up $1.8 million to get him released. I actually am not entirely clear on how this all worked out. But essentially, they put up $1.8 million. And because of that, he then owes them three albums. And this puts him in a very dangerous place where he's distancing himself from Jada a lot because he's hanging out with really dangerous people. Post-jail, Pac was a little different. Who isn't after doing time? I believe he's allowing bitterness, disappointment, and anger to be preyed on. I'm worried about you. I say, interrupting his flow. They get into this massive fight because he says that she's not a real one anymore. That she's gone Hollywood. Yeah, and she's like, I am real. I'm just worried about you. And they have this huge fight, and it is the last time they really hang out. She does this the same way a couple other of our memoirs have done this, where she's like, and that was the lesson I learned. If you have a problem with someone, you have to sort it out because you never know if it's the last time you'll talk to them. She loses more people before the last time she talks to them. Yeah, she's still learning that lesson every time someone dies. Yeah. Which I will say, it's like a hard lesson to learn. Totally. You never know when someone is going to die. So they don't talk for a year after this fight. And then on September 8th, 1996, Pac was shot in Las Vegas. He is in a coma. And I think because he had gotten shot five times before, been through jail, been out again, there's this idea that's like, well, He'll live. He'll live. And so she means to go visit him like on day five of his coma, whether he's woken up or not. And unfortunately, he dies beforehand. He was cremated, which she believes was to cover up evidence. As time passed, it healed nothing. I didn't even know how to grieve Pac. So I stuffed my rage, my pain and my shame into a forgotten place within me. And I never again felt the same love for hip hop or the streets. From then on, it was all dead to me. We heard the story in Will Smith's book, right? Earlier in their relationship, his grandma comes to visit. And he plans out this hilarious prank 
where he's going to have his grandma watching Jada's sex scene from Jason's lyric as Jada walks in the door to meet his grandmother for the first time. Can I say something that she adds that is a whole other layer of fucked up? That it wasn't even her naked? Yeah, she had a body double. Yeah. To this day, Will and I are debating whether it was funny or not. Okay, can I say, if you guys are still debating if it's funny, like you still think it's not funny and he still thinks it is funny, that means it's not funny. Yeah, if you haven't come around 40 years later to laugh about it. Their careers are both blowing up. His, obviously, more so. He is, like, not nice. I don't know. She tells a lot of stories about him that are really fucked up. At one point, she's so busy that she hasn't gotten waxed in a long time. And he's like, are you going to do something about that? And she's like, whatever. I mean, she literally says you don't understand how painful it is. Yeah. And he goes and, like, puts a wig in his underwear and starts walking around and being like, look, I'm Jada. He goes, so you okay looking like this? To this day, I've never been able to unsee him like that. For some reason, it's when Will makes fun of me. That level of creativity, I find his comedy unparalleled. I mean, that's really mean, actually. I just like don't think that's like unparalleled creative comedy. I guess I think that if you think that that is funny, then it's fine. I don't want to tell her that that's like horribly disrespectful. I know she just talked about how he was always so silly. He would never go deep with her. Whenever she was serious or upset, he would always make her laugh. Sometimes she would try not to laugh on purpose, but she was like, it was good. We balanced each other. I was always depressed and he was always like ignoring my feelings completely and making a joke of it. Then she tells another story about a time she was with good friends, Caesar the dog guy. <laughs> and they go on a hike and she like falls and rolls her ankle really bad and she's in so much pain. And she gets home and she's like, I'm fine. And he's like, great. And she's like, but could you take a look just in case I'm not fine and maybe need to go to the hospital? And he's like, mm, it's fine. And then the next day she wakes up and she's like, I, I think it maybe isn't fine. And somebody else has to take her to the hospital. And he's like, well, I'm actually so busy today, so I can't take you. And then she gets to the hospital and it's broken. Ignoring hurts in yourself for your loved one, by the way, can come back to create far worse pain. If you don't learn this lesson early, it's much harder to learn later. My misstep was being invested in the image of being strong and unbreakable. Will liked that. My strength was the comfort pocket. Yes, I was strong and fragile at once, except I had no idea how to express the parts of myself that needed a hug. Can I say, this is the thing of her, like, therapizing herself into a corner. And, like, I don't think blaming other people for every action is right. But I think to be like, I wasn't expressing my needs. I wasn't doing this. I wasn't doing that. Like, you can also be like, also, when I'm crying in the corner, I wish I'd been with a partner who cared. Yes. I think when you say, can you take a look at this? What do you think? That is kind of expressing. Yeah. Obviously, you hoping someone cares. And then later she straight up says, well, Will doesn't care about feelings. So that's my problem is that I expect him to care about my feelings. And I'm like, what else is a husband for? I do think that if you need someone to drive you to the hospital because of a broken ankle and your husband is in town, like, I'm sorry, if you broke your ankle and Mac was like, I have a meeting, I'd be like, how important is the meeting? Like, if he's out of town, of course, I'm there. And even if you need me there, I'm there. But like, no, you I are agree. married. That's the whole point of it. That's the whole point of it. So she gets pregnant in 1997. She's 25 years old. They're on vacation. She feels it immediately. She says she like knows the minute they're done making love. It was like when a bank vault locks. She also like is not obsessed with getting married. She's like, you know what? If he doesn't want to like jump in on this, I'll be a single mom. And her mother is like, no, you have to be married to have a baby, which is crazy because her mom had four husbands and that's a big trauma in their family. So he is like, yeah, we'll get married. And she's like, okay, well, I don't want a wedding. And her mom was like, well, you're going to have a wedding. So they planned the shotgun wedding. All I wanted was for me and Will to meet on a mountaintop, just the two of us, and someone to officiate the ceremony as we exchanged vows we had written under the power of the universal source that would be guiding this marriage along the way. I think we keep saying universal life. Yeah. That's not true. Okay, sorry. That's the website where you can become inefficient. Oh. But she does refer to the universal source as like her understanding of God. So another interesting fact is that they do not have a prenup. And I wonder how much that has contributed to them not currently being divorced. Will began, you know, my team is thinking that I should get a prenup. This made sense. He was freshly divorced and in the midst of paying alimony and child support while also paying off a big tax debt. I pause and look at Will. Well, do you think we should get one? I don't know. What do you think? I think that if you don't trust me and you need to think about our breakup before we even get married, maybe we shouldn't get married. If we're going into this marriage with the possibility that divorce could happen, then I don't want us to do it. I'm not going to start the end of our marriage in the beginning. Will agreed without hesitation and went back into the house. And that was that. It was as if he was saying in the moment, I trust you. And I was saying, I love you enough that no matter what happens, we're going to work through it. Whatever inevitable challenges come up, for better or for worse, we are in this for the long haul. Everything we would have, we would build together. That was a given from then on till this day. 
Without that agreement, divorce might have been a reality, but with it, we have saved ourselves from irrevocable strife on more than a few occasions. Mm. Hmm. Mm. Hmm. They get married. Halfway down the aisle, I was overtaken by emotion and couldn't stop crying. Straight up bawling. There was a lifting of heaviness I'd been carrying for so long. It felt like something old had died and something new within me came in. I felt at ease. It was almost like I had been standing on a cliff with all the anticipation of what the fall was going to be like. Now that I had taken the leap, I felt as if I had landed unscathed. I think she is just very happy to have a family that's like financially stable and she has this baby on the way and she loves Trey, Will's son from his first marriage. And I do think she's just like happy to have landed. Yeah. She and Cherie end up working out their differences as she gets further in her pregnancy. She's like, it actually will not be good if we are bickering. I think now she says they're sisters. They've become like sisters. They've become like sisters. But it took a while. She says, first, we were not friends, but we became allies. And now we're sisters. But she says the beginning, Cherie called to talk to the son. And she was like, I don't like that I have to go through you. And she was like, well, this is my house. And Cherie's like, that I picked out. (laughs) Yeesh. Ah. She's like, you know, it's funny because we both felt insecure about the other. Yeah. She did not like that I was her replacement. And I did not like that I felt I could never live up to the like OG wife. Well, you beat her, I think. (laughs) Fair to say. So she like does a lot of pages about how wonderful her kids are. Trey is an icon. It was Will's idea to name Jaden after Jada. And she said, I don't think I'm worthy of having this child named after me. But they did it. They all have harrowing birth stories. I'll tell you, I've never heard a birth story that was... Easy peasy. (laughs) God, she really like gives Jaden a lot of credit about his like wisdom. And I do think he sounds like a precocious little kid, but I don't know that you can be like, my kid can just decide their education. Yeah, when he was two, he didn't want to go to preschool. So then she said, well, what Jaden taught me that summer was eye opening. He was never left in an educational institution ever again, unless by his own self determination. He was homeschooled from then on. Yeah, she dropped him off at school for the first day. And he said, Mommy, why are you going to leave me here with people who don't love me? (laughs) That is like really intense. (laughs) Can you imagine? That's like a really insane thing for a little kid to say. (laughs) Oh, my God. Where did he like learn that? I don't know. I feel like that's a crazy way to look at the world as those who love me and then everybody else. At three years old to be like the people who love me I've met and everybody else is a stranger not worth knowing. (laughs) Because that's what she says. She's like, he ended up going for all two weeks. The teacher's like, he'd be polite, but he never made a friend. He refused. And I was like, oh, keep your click small. He never let anyone in until he met Rico from Hannah Montana. (laughs) Are they good friends? Moises in the book. That's Rico? Yeah. Uh Uh-oh. I learned early, do not mess with Jaden's inner compass and do not take his gentleness or kindness as weakness. Listen, I love like respecting your kid on their like knowledge journey. To me, it feels like the same Jada who was like, I had never even considered that people have multiple perspectives. (laughs) I guess to me, it's the same Jada who goes, he took me on his private jet, which was like back in the day, pretty impressive. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, I think Willow, she's only put out bangers. She's a banger machine. Jaden, he came up with Just Water. Brilliant. I love Just Water. There is this sense that she's like, no, you don't understand at 11 years old, Willow heard about sex trafficking and stopped it. (laughs) She literally says Willow watched Coney 2012 on YouTube and said, why is nobody talking about this? I'm like, I think Coney 2012 was the most watched YouTube video of all time. Yeah. No, people are talking about it. That's how you just found out now. Do you think you heard that in the wind? And then Jaden solved Flint, Michigan. Water. She's like, he built a business when he was seven that he came up with on his own. And all he had was the support of our financial team. (laughs) We did help him with lawyers. But besides that, it was all his idea. He came up with this idea of fixing the world. And we said, we will give you the personnel and the money. (laughs) But the dream? That's all yours. And listen, I don't think they're not great kids. I'm like, they didn't grow up where you grew up, Jada. Yeah. They grew up with everything at their disposal. Plus, they didn't even have to go to school. Do you know what I could have accomplished if I never went to school? I would have seen all the TikToks already. I would have learned how to make my own fireworks show. (laughs) Can I say, I actually admire the way she is like so deeply protective of her family. Like that is the core of this unit that she's created where like her and Will don't even like each other, but she like won't not protect him. But she talks about this time that Willow banged her head. And I had to reread this a few times because it didn't even really strike me what happened. Most of the time I could stay strong in a crisis, though I had lost it one day when I had to drive Willow to karate class. 
She came into the bedroom to say goodbye to Will, and as she jumped towards his arms, she slipped from his grasp and hit her head on the corner of the bed, slicing her forehead open. Blood spurted everywhere, like she almost fainted. Will handled it. She looked at me and said, Mommy, can you fix it and make it better? It broke me. It would take me years to fully embrace whatever feelings came up from seeing her pain. This whole story is pretty wacky, but I think the main thing is that Will dropped her and she sliced her head open. It's like very carefully worded to be like she was jumping around and then I couldn't save her. But I am like, it does seem like Will dropped her on her head. (laughs) Who among us hasn't dropped a kid? Not my mom. So now that we've established that her children are perfect and extremely intelligent, which I don't not agree with. I mean, that song, the caught a vibe, that was like the best song I'd ever heard in my entire life. What about whip my hair back and forth? The second best song I've ever heard in my life after the Caught a Vibe song. <laughs> Can I say they were both the best songs I'd ever heard in my life at different points in my life? Yeah. I think at one point in my life, I was trying to whip my hair more. And then I was like actually trying to catch a vibe more. Can I say something, Ashley? Yeah. As your best friend, you caught the vibe. Thank you. You're a vibe catcher. Anyway, so now she gets into her relationship with Will, which, you know, has had its ups and downs. Perspective is everything, she writes. It's something that she learned early in her relationship with Will. In many ways, Will and I were like so many young couples who grow up with instability and dysfunction, but do not acquire the tools to confront them. My fallback position, rather than showing vulnerability, was to hide, to cover my feelings or fight, whether overtly or covertly. So I want to back up a little bit even in this chapter. So she starts with that exact sentence, perspective is everything. And then she goes on this like long tangent about how relationships are actually difficult because in order to be on the same team, you have to be willing to see things from each other's perspective in order to compromise. And that takes work, whereas movies and TV make relationships look so easy. And it's very, uh, I think Flufo was saying this, that it's very Dax Shepard and Kristen where they're like, so we are heroically showing you the failures of our relationship to be like, it's actually so normal to hate the person you're with and even to like be separated from them for years. Marriage can be divorce and people (laughs) don't really talk about that enough. So we finally get into the perspectives that they were not able to share. Though I don't consider myself a romantic, I expected Will to save me and heal my past hurts, as if the traumas, chaos, and depression experience before we met would magically disappear within the ether of ecstatic love. She does this again, where she's like, I expected him to heal me. I don't think she expected that. I think she wanted him to view her perspective as well. And he never does that. Like, this is the manipulative thing that I believe, based on reading this book and his book, that he does is he presents his perspective. And it's like the compromise is you coming around to what I think. She also says, so they begin these arguments. Will could talk circles around me at the time. So when I felt he wasn't listening and was being disrespectful, that would piss me off. Once in a heated argument, I let go and F you, fighting the style that I knew best. Will wasn't having it. He said, in effect, I can't be in a relationship with you. This isn't going to work. He broke up with me on the spot. I also want to point out that she's like, he consistently speaks circles around me. Just because he is like a more masterful communicator does not mean that he gets to always win. And it is like, fucked up that he is using the fact that he's more skilled at this verbal kind of combat. And then when Jada resorts to what she has available to her, he's like, no, I'm out. Just because he's using like calm words, she says she feels disrespected. She feels just as disrespected as apparently he does when she says, fuck you. Right. But he is always the one to go, this is over. Yes. So they're able to like come back and she says, I understand now that I can't talk to him that way. He set a boundary and I have to respect it. We were only broken up for a week. This pattern kept us safe from talking about real feelings, but also from experiencing them. Which is a bad pattern. Yeah, she goes, so we learned to communicate the way he wanted to communicate. Some couples managed to argue authentically. In our case, our arguments verged on being too sanitized and controlled to the point where I'd lose genuine expression and suppress deep feelings. She talks about this experience where they went to Disney World and he was becoming like very famous at this time. And a crowd like rushes them and she freaks out. Like this is just very traumatizing for her. Like literally the crowd runs towards them. She's five feet tall again and 90 pounds and has been in situations where people have tried to murder her. So she starts screaming, back the fuck up, back the fuck up. And everyone, including Will, looks at her like she's insane. And afterwards, like Will not understand her perspective that being rushed by a crowd of people at her size is very intimidating. He's like, I don't know. It just like wasn't that crazy. And she's like, okay, well, to me it was. And he's like, no, you overreacted. And she's like, I guess I did overreact. And it's like, that is not compromise. You could take this example of conflicting perspectives and apply it to everything else in our entire marriage and get the same results. Sometimes you can find common ground to balance out your differences. But if you don't attempt to reconcile the warranting viewpoints that play, resentment, anger, and regret will only grow. So she goes, 
he thinks I overreacted and I'm upset because I think he underreacted. I'm clearly in a crisis and he's saying you're out of line. And I actually think in a couple, if one person is upset about something, you don't get to say no. Yeah. Like you're allowed to be like, why didn't she protect me? So then she says an interesting reversal is that the way she feels about being mobbed by crowds, he feels about paparazzi. For him, taking unwarranted photos was a violation and he perceived that as a threat. It raised his alarm system for fight or flight. With paparazzi, though they can be annoying, I didn't feel the same lack of control I did with the swarming crowds. But she's like, I learned this thing where I would just say, listen, I'll give you the photos you want, but stay 20 feet back. I take some photos, we move on, mutual respect. But for him, someone who's so anal about his image, I guess the idea of a single candid getting out of there is worse than a physical body attack on him or his fucking wife. I'm sorry. You don't get to have a wife if you don't think it's bad when people swarm and mob her. Right. If you don't want to protect a wife, you shouldn't have a wife. And she doesn't say any conclusion of this photo disagreement. But anyway, so she talks about one time when there was like a pesticide person in their house who she'd worked with a handful of times. And then it was like their last time working together. So she's like, oh, I guess this is the end of our services. I'll send you the check. And he freaks out and is like, give me the money right now. And so she freaks out and like threatens him and then calls Will to be like, I am really shaken up. I was just threatened in my own kitchen. And he goes, oh, okay. And he never brings it up again. And she's like, maybe I didn't do enough to make him understand how bad I felt. I'm so bad at sharing emotions. But I don't know, Jada. You called him and said this thing just happened to me. And I freaked out and reacted like this. I do think having to ask your partner to care about you is not failure on your behalf. It's just story after story. There's not one story in this book where I feel that she has been supported by him and which makes the slap at the end like all the more a slap in the face. (laughs) Well said. Thank you. When you go back to think about how she says, my love language is protection. Right. I do think she has like therapized herself. She is so in Will's orbit of not wanting to rock that boat. I don't know. I get that there's like only so much you can do to somebody else. Like a lot of times you have to heal within yourself. But I'm like, you're allowed to be mad. And I think the way that she has convinced herself, like, well, we just have different love languages. His is making a ton of money. And mine is feeling protected when I'm with my husband or partner. And I actually think that the problem there is suggesting that like feeling protected and safe with your partner is a unique thing to you and not just a reasonable facet of any healthy relationship. Yeah, I think the way she like justifies the ways in which she doesn't show up for her, it just makes me very sad. It's always her fault. But at some point, it is the job of a partner to at some point check in on you, especially when you're calling and saying something upsetting just happened to me. My ankle looks broken. What do you think? I'm scared right now. Like, I don't think that you can force another person to be the partner that you want them to be. But she could have not been with that partner. Like, in the same way that he constantly draws the line and is like, this is a deal breaker for me. I won't be with you if you act like this. I won't be with you if you act like this. I think he made her feel very powerless to setting her own boundaries because they would have been not together. And I don't think she was willing to try that because she wanted partnership so badly. Yes. And I think as they built this world, I mean, it really was like rapid fire. She was 25 when she got pregnant. And when you think about his ascent into global stardom, and he was always forthcoming about his goal of being the number one actor in the world, and he achieved it. And I think it was just like hit after hit. And I think she probably got swept up in this world that was so fast. Her best friend is dead. She's soon to lose her other best friend. She's coming from this unstable world. I think that she was scared to lose the whole life. And that's not to like knock her for being materialistic. I said to Ashley before we started like recording it almost feels like she was the deputy mayor of their city like they didn't just have a family together in a marriage they had a city that he was the mayor and she was like his assistant mayor and if she were to divorce him and leave that she wouldn't just leave the money and leave the partnership she's leaving this whole town that they've created this is when she's still weighing the pros and cons and then she was too stuck in it she talks about how they would take their entire family and staff on vacation every year we heard about this in will's book it started out with just 40 people that's a lot of people to plan a christmas for Will, the showman and the MC, was like the executive producer dreaming up experiences for all to enjoy, whereas I was the assistant producer, information point person, and for a while, everybody's girl Friday. Who was flying from where and getting picked up when? How many people were at the house and who was staying in what bedroom? Who needed ski lift tickets and local transportation? And where were the toothbrushes? Even though I had Mia and Fawn to help, I was on the ground communication hub from point to point. As a new wife and mom, I was often overwhelmed by trying to adapt to an even larger whirlwind. I just want to say... I agree with you. She could have left. She could have said, you're not the right partner for and me. I, but I don't I, want to like judge her for not leaving. I'm, I just think when I like am saying the realities of what I believe like her over therapization are is that she did need these things, but it's not her fault that he just is not those things. And what I would go a step further is and say, 
the way that she's convinced herself that like, well, we didn't work out because I'm just somebody who needs to feel safe and protected with my husband. I would actually argue that it's not that he was not a good partner for her. He's not a good partner to anyone. Right. He is not looking to be a partner. He is looking to be a CEO and he's looking for a second in command. Right. Completely agree. She also is very adamant that she never traded on his success. At what point she's trying to get a movie made, even though they have like Denzel Washington starring in it. But they're like, we aren't going to do this movie unless Will Smith is also EPing. And she's like, no, it's my project. And so she withdraws the film. Our most profound differences in perspective was a clash in our vision of what happiness looked like. That, can I say, it feels to me like just someone you can't get married. If you both fundamentally have opposite ideas about what it looks like to be happy, like how are you going to set up a life? Will was living his dream and that meant I must be living mine too, through him. He couldn't understand why I was often unhappy. His attitude was, why would you want for anything? Look at the life and the opportunities I provide for you. All we get to have and do and be. My attitude was, yes, you have a point and I have hitched a ride on someone else's train, someone I love, except I don't know how to jump off it from time to time to ride my own train. It feels like I can't grasp my own journey. At times, I feel resentful and angry. Mostly, I don't know what to do about it. Yikes. So then we get into like a lot of her career stuff. She spends five years doing like a metal band. It's weird. Obviously, five years is a significant amount of time to be touring, practicing, putting all of your energy into something, especially when you're a mother, especially when you're still like a working actress. And she talks about it the way someone else might talk about running a marathon. Yeah, she's very proud of it. It's what she did for five years. That's like a huge amount of time. And the idea of like, I put together this rock band, this metal band that toured the world and took me away from my family. But also it feels so unimportant. She really is like, I just had this thing that I wanted to do for me. Yeah. Five years when you are like the mother of young children who does not have a father who's everything about it is odd. I think her kids toured with her a lot. It's really interesting. And they did a lot of really random things. Like she opened for Britney Spears for a while. Anyway, so she ends up leaving the band or pausing the band because she was like, okay, I made my kids tour with me for a while. And then Jaden was going to do the pursuit of happiness. So I had to put my dreams on hold to help him fulfill his dreams. And I was like, okay, he didn't actually have to be like a seven-year-old actor, but also you should quit that metal band. And so then we get into the marriage again, which I, this is the weirdest fucking part. Every story about Will Smith is like, oh, I cannot believe a psycho is in the costume of a goofball. First of all, that's appropriation of my culture. Anyway, so she tries to quit in the middle of OzFest, which is a tour that no one thought she deserved to be on with her band. But they did it anyway to like mixed reviews. And then she like gets really sick in the middle. The doctor is like, you might have cancer. You're so inflamed. And they're like, oh, you actually don't have cancer, but you're like freakishly inflamed. So you should stop doing whatever you're doing. And Will is like, you can't quit. If you quit, you'll regret it forever. You absolutely have to finish the tour. Then she tells a story about Tom Cruise. Oh, yeah. She and Tom Cruise did a movie together. And he's like, sometimes I would hold back on the red carpet or when doing press. Tom always had a powerful reminder for me in those instances. Hey, he would begin looking me right in the eye. Never forget how smart and talented you are. Now go out there and make somebody smile because you shook their hand at the red carpet today. That was so helpful. Um, I don't think she's like realizing how like deeply manipulative it is. Something about that is like everything I needed to know about Tom Cruise. Yeah. The way that he can come and convince what you think is charming and helpful to you in a way that is ultimately serves his purpose of promoting his movie. Okay. And then in the next chapter, we get to the part that I'm excited to talk about the craziest, most telling lines about their marriage. I'm sorry. I know I said this wouldn't be like a Jada throwdown, but she makes it kind of hard. Okay. She says, I tried to cultivate an open, realistic line of communication in my marriage, and I tried to honor my own growth as the seeker that I am. One traditional aspect of our marriage is that we put family first. And for a few reasons, we were both adamantly against divorce. Will is divorced. (laughs) I just think you can't say we're adamantly against divorce when you've already done it. So she talks about the problems in their relationship again. She says, we need to work on our connection. We need to strengthen the love and the connection between us. Will responded, we'll get to that later. Classic. This was a reasonable response for someone who grew up without financial stability and security. So she goes on to be like, he doesn't understand that connection is important in addition to money. But to me, we should do connection. But he thinks he should make all the money in the world first and then we'll connect later. I do think all the money in the world is like apt. I think he's like, when I have all of the dollars and we can be sure that nobody else has dollars, (laughs) then you and me can sit down and get to know one another. But until then, I'm on the pursuit of happiness. So she talks about their relationship and like how they've always kind of had this understanding that because of their jobs, temptation is out there. She says, good luck to anyone in their late 20s slash early 30s who has that down pat. Some significant others might expect an incredible amount of willpower, no pun intended. 
in service of the ideals of matrimony. If that works for you, many blessings. But in my case, I wanted to be aligned with which I deemed inevitable. This was less about Will, but rather about my own experience with the nature of temptation. In the paragraph before, she's like, Will starred alongside many babes. But it wasn't about him. It was about me. Yeah. And my faults. We had already run across a few situations that made me want to come up with a proactive solution to protect the sanctity of our trust. Okay, so if you've already come across situations, a solution at that point is not proactive, but reactive. Okay, I think you've left out an insanely important caveat here. She starts this chapter by saying, I rarely felt the need to please or placate the chatters or to refute every ridiculous rumor that popped up. Later on, when controversies got out of hand and folks believed Will and I were swingers or that we were both gay and playing as each other's beards, or that we were sleeping with whomever we chose, wherever we chose. All I could do was sit back and shake my head. It got so ridiculous. Okay. She's like, people think I'm in an open relationship. I'm not. We're in this thing where we're allowed to have sex with other people if you tell each other first. Yeah. She literally specifies we are not in an open relationship. We're in a relationship where if we cheat on each other, we have to be open about it. So we're open about the fact that we cheat on each other with each other, but the relationship is not open. We're like open to cheating. But in that way, they still have their trust. She's like, you can't fuck whoever you want. But if you accidentally fuck someone else, it's like within the bounds of our relationship. Sometimes it's just out of control. In other words, a relationship of transparency, which is different than an open relationship. Mm -hmm. The agreement was never you can go sleep with whomever you want, whenever you want. Instead, it was, hey, when those temptations are in play, let's trust each other to come together in partnership with the truth, talk and work as partners through them. In this way, we eliminated any possibility of betrayal. Eliminate him. Okay, so then she talks about how she homeschooled her kids and they like built their own schooling experience, but they also like had to bring people from other backgrounds in. So they like ended up creating their own full on school. I really like it when rich people are like, okay, the way that poor people are doing school is just not the smartest way. She also says there was some controversy about my approach to education, probably because of the use of study technology learning method that I discovered when I was introduced to Scientology. Study tech, although it came from Scientology, is legally defined as secular. Totally. Legally defined as secular is the craziest thing I've ever heard. They went to court. It's not Scientology. (laughs) Willow at one point is like, I really want to go to a normal school. So she lets her go for a year. And she comes back. She goes, I was actually impressed by the skill sets she attained, including new methods of organization for her studies, as well as time management. I can't believe that like not having your mom who's on the road all the time, be your teacher, taught you that like sometimes things are due. (laughs) And then she goes, overall, Willow believed attending traditional school was a worthy experience. Cool. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that this 12-year-old thinks the way that the rest of this country is being raised is worthy. So then her dad comes back into her life. She does not really want a father, but then her half-brother calls and is like, he's actually doing really bad with drugs. So she enrolls him in like Scientology rehab and he gets sober. He's like up and playing basketball within like two weeks. But then he leaves because he's like, I don't want to be a Scientologist. And she's like, oh, my God, it's so weird that they're making him try to be a Scientologist at Scientology rehab because they never really tried to make me be a Scientologist at Scientology school that I go to where I'm becoming a Scientologist. (laughs) Then her father relapses and he does end up passing away. My father taught me a morbid but valuable lesson that if I am in a disagreement with someone, I ask whether the conflict or upset would exist if that person was on their deathbed. If I can answer that it wouldn't matter in that instance, I know I should let it go. That's like kind of the same lesson she learned with Tupac. It's a hard lesson. Then we get into like Jaden's acting career. Willow does whip my hair and then is actually like, I don't want a record deal. It's not that fun. And she's like, wow, that's crazy. Normally, it's my instinct to like push her into this great opportunity. But if she doesn't want to do it, she won't do it. Then she falls deep into a depression again. She's about to hit 40 years old and she is not doing well. And Will is planning this like massive blowout for her 40th birthday, which we learned about in his book. And she had been telling everybody, I don't want to party. I don't want to party. I'm not in a good place. I'm begging people not to have a party. Her friend is like, I have to tell you something. Will is planning a party. And she goes to Will and is like, I'm begging you. Do not throw me a party. And so he makes it a small version of the party. But she is miserable. The gilded cage I had built felt like a prison. I had walked in here on my own. I couldn't come up with a solution and I couldn't remedy my shame about being unhappy. The soundtrack was a broken record. What's wrong with me? Am I inherently broken? Why can't I be happy? And this brings us back to the intro where she is now scouting out places to make her death look like an accident. Well, first he throws her this party. Yeah. And she goes and everybody who's there, it's like small. And she's like, it's crazy. Everybody I love is here being so nice to me. And I've never felt more alone. And that's when she's like, okay. If I can't be happy at a birthday party, then it's done for me. And she says she had never even imagined her life past 40. Yeah, it's very sad. 
So she goes to this ayahuasca ceremony and she does her three nights. The first two, she was like, this was fun. And then the third night, she like goes in fearless and has just a horrifying experience where there are voices in a pit like clawing up at her telling her she's worthless. She realizes later that it's the voices from her own head, but she's hearing them like they're coming from the outside. I go look at myself in the mirror all while being chased by taunting voices. Jada, just do it. Just fucking kill yourself. Just fucking kill yourself. Your kids will be better off without you. All they need is will. All everyone needs is will. I mean, it's devastating. I mean, yeah. And it's like, you have to get away from Will. This yeah. is what the inner voices are saying. She did three nights of ayahuasca. And she later understands that Mother Aya is showing me my own suicidal thoughts. She's showing me all the unloved parts of myself needing light. But she begs the medicine woman for a fourth night because she's like, that third night, like, I feel like now I'm accidentally like trapped with my demons and I need a fourth night. So she does a fourth night and she feels cleansed. She lets go after a psychological storm, a cleansing follows. And that's what this is, a cleansing, a purification of thoughts, beliefs, and energies that are not born of light no longer serve me. Suddenly it hits me. My whole ordeal has been one of my own making. I've been taunting myself with false beliefs about my life and who I am. I mean, you also have like a bad husband. So she says afterwards, like she has felt depression since, but she's never been suicidal since. Yes. And she felt like unadulterated joy for the first time in a very long time. And her kids were so happy to hear that from her. And then she has this crazy thing where she like goes into the house one day and hears music. And it's like, who could that be? And it's Jaden. Why did you think it was crazy that Jaden was listening to music? Yeah, but it was like loud music in the multi-purpose room. And he's holding charcoal and making a painting. Which is the ballroom, which she's like, it sounds fancier than it is. It's just like a huge room that we can have like charity functions and massive gatherings. And it's like not that fancy to have a ballroom. <laughs> She walks in and he goes, I need something different, mom. It's nothing personal. I love you, but I think it's time for me to leave. He's 15 at this point. I knew exactly what he meant. He had been feeling trapped in a certain way and the change she saw was necessary for him to give him some space. He needed to spread his wings in the way that he felt was best for him. This is crazy. For a moment, we were all quiet. Will was out of town working and my first impulse was to say, hold up, let's talk to your dad about this. But Will left most decisions with respect to the kids up to me. And I thought this needed an immediate response. Can you imagine being like, okay, my 15 year old son wants to move out and live with his friends. His dad really isn't going to even give a shit about this conversation. Can I say that is even crazy to me. I feel like there's a lot of family dynamics where they're like the mom decides. What's crazier to me is that your 15 year old out of nowhere goes, I need to move out. And you go, OK, yes or no right now. Why would that be a right now decision? You can think about it. Why not be like, OK, let's talk about like what would make sense for you to have some more freedom. He was packed and his friends were picking him up that night. He just like left. I'm like, Jada, what happened here? Why even tell us if you're going to lie? Yeah. Because what do you mean one day you come into music and him holding charcoal? What is charcoal? This is when she explains just water. I'm like, was he filtering water in the multipurpose room? I honestly, I don't understand. And he just moves out. And then she like starts using this thing with the rain. Like he says he needs to move out and feel the rain. We can talk for hours about questions of existence. He reminds me frequently beauty and blessings within the rain. Like, I don't know what this means. And then Willow wants to feel the rain. Everyone is trying to feel the rain. Willow cuts her hair and she finds it very inspiring. A bald head, easier to feel the rain. <laughs> yeah, totally. More and more, my way of walking edges and feeling the rain was through plant medicine ceremonies. And then she and Will like have a discussion where they decide to be broken up, but not divorced. In hindsight, I clearly see that my 40th birthday was our breaking point. It was nobody's fault as much as I wanted him to love me. That would never happen if I didn't love myself. And the same applied to him. Will and I had pictures in our mind of what a happily married couple was and our pictures didn't match. I mean, that's been your entire relationship. They've been in two separate relationships the entire time they've been together. I mean, I also think Will Smith's vision of a happily married family is he makes all the money in the world and becomes the most successful person of all time. And so is like admired and adored and loved. And his wife is just grateful about it. Yeah. After almost 20 years, give or take, it seemed that nothing was going to change between us. By his own admission, feelings were not a priority for Will. How he felt, how anybody felt was not a priority. That was a difficult reality for me to continue to navigate and accept. How many years I've been clinging to, we'll get to that later, the time when I could express my need for a deeper emotional connection. So they decided that they're going to break up and not get divorced. We didn't believe we owed the public any specifics, which was, without a doubt, a slippery slope. The pitfall for me in this plan, and I stepped right into it, was believing I was evolved enough to manage this alternative approach to ending our marriage. The pseudo-guru, who uses rationale and borrowed wisdom to tell you what you want to hear, insisted that because of my nearly four years of plant medicine work and spiritual growth, this decision was elevated and correct. Oh, what a fool we mortals be. The reckoning was to come. Okay, here's what I have to say about this. I agree that you don't owe the public anything about your family and your marriage, except for that you guys have insisted on making your marriage like all of our business. Yeah. To make this decision and be like, but nobody deserves to know, but Will is going to write a book and I'm going to go to Red Table Talk. That whole entanglement thing, the fact that they left out that they were not together is like insane. Why be honest if you're going to lie so bad? 
Okay, I will say this gets to the part that I actually found really human and interesting. This idea of like trying to hack monogamy and the way that it's like so difficult. I like found it very real that she was like, we were trying to try to figure out some different way that maybe would work better and how none of it really works. A breakup is a breakup, no matter how you goopify it. Totally. So then one day Willow is like, why don't I know anything about you other than the fact that you're my mom? And she's like, really good question. Let's sell this idea. (laughs) So they do the red table talks, which is supposed to be like open conversations between three generations of women. And it obviously ends up becoming like a big interview series. Can I say, she's like, I realize no one's ever been honest before. What if I had a conversation where people were honest? I'm like, first of all, you're you not, are honest. not honest. And also she really is like, I've noticed nowhere is anyone having a real convo. And I'm like, I think they are. You just like aren't looking that hard. Through communication, confession, and through expression, the red table is where we can purify our hearts and our souls and clear up confusing dynamics within us and between other people. And this is because I think she's so blocked by her own inability to like acknowledge certain truths. Why don't women open up and share our experiences and wisdom with one another more often and in a deep way? She thinks the only deep person on earth is Will Smith. I know. And the thing is, I don't begrudge her inability to like conquer these mountains. But I do think she can't be like, no one has conquered these mountains. I'm sorry to say that. Why aren't women having conversations? We are. Where have you been? Yeah, we're trying. Then she starts losing her hair. But she is like, it must be a hormone thing and it'll fix itself. And then it does. So she's like, no big deal. And she also doesn't talk about it. There's even an opportunity. They do a girl's trip, coronavirus, quarantine, reunion, and they're all talking about doing their own hair at home. And somebody's like, oh, and Jada, you have like the best edges. And she quietly is like, not anymore. And then it's like, I was so happy they didn't ask more. It's just so interesting that she's seeing her being like, we have to be vulnerable. We have to be honest. We have to be deep. We have to be real. Why aren't any women being real? And it's like, a lot of women are. You are not. And again, she doesn't owe anybody this information. But it is really hard to hear her be like, no one's talking. So I invented a show where we're honest all the time, except for me. Yeah. She also says this line where she's like, the most wonderful part about having these free-flowing conversations with women I respect was the realization that my challenges didn't make me as special as I thought I was. So anyway, then the thing about August rumbles up again during COVID. So, or I mean, I guess she doesn't say August at any point during this book, but the guy that she had an entanglement with an affair, as many would call it, because no one knew she was not married anymore, rumbles up. I guess this guy starts talking and she's like, okay, it's so weird that it came up way later, but whatever. And so she decides to do a vulnerable red table talk about it. And Will decides to sit down with her. At like last minute, he gets home early from a work trip and straight off the plane, he's like, yeah, I'll be here for this. Midway through the table talk, I could feel the conversation start to turn. It was clear that Will and I were no longer in alignment and the train goes off the track. I didn't want to oppose Will publicly. In my codependent way, I took the blame and played the pleasing and appeasing role I know so well. This trauma reaction was an old friend I thought I'd kick to the curb, but clearly it was still activated when I was in fear of being abandoned or being protected. You're not being protected. He's literally chucking you under the bus. He called the bus and said, this is what time I need you to drive by and then keep circling back in case I push her at the wrong time. They were broken up for, I think, four years at this point. And she's like, you know, his eyes were watering, but it's just because he has watery eyes. I'm like, I don't know. He was acting very hurt. Yeah. But then here's where it gets crazy. Her own producers are like, don't publish this. It makes you look bad. You're going to get all the flack. It looks like you cheated on him and he's so heartbroken and you're this bitch. Just do it again. And she just goes, no. She airs it. And then she has this dream. In the dream, I called Will and said, why did you do that to me? Why would you ever do that to me? While I continued to rant, Will waited patiently and finally replied, The bigger question is, why did you do that to yourself? It's your show and you didn't have to put it out. And then she becomes a wolf and she eats him. And then I devoured him. I howled out to the moon with blood dripping from my jaws. And I looked at the ground to find the one thing that was left of him, a bloody severed index finger. I took my grotesque werewolf foot and kicked his index finger over a canyon through the moonlit sky. I abruptly woke up at first startled and I had to think, what the hell was that? Then I had to chuckle. Why did I have to kick his finger over the canyon like that? You guys want to guess what conclusion she came to? Because she went and she thought, what does that dream mean? And she said, the index finger actually means the ego. And she realized it's my own ego. The problem was my ego. In a dream where she murders Will and kicks his ego into the canyon, she came back and said, that was my problem. That was my fault. I shouldn't have done that. No comment. So then things are progressing. She goes on like a lot of spiritual seeking journeys. This is where I lost it. And I think me and Ash have been talking about it. This is a woman who needs a divorce. And I think that there is a lot of trauma in her childhood. And there's a lot of things 
And listen, we believe in therapy, but she's been to the therapy. She's done the ayahuasca. She's friends with Jay Shetty. She met Jay Shetty's mentor. She's met every Buddhist monk. She's now in Vietnam meeting another Buddhist monk. And then she meets that monk's his mentor. She's meeting every fucking mentor in the world, every YouTube self-help guru, every religion, every Scientology. She's tried it all. Somehow we get to the bottom of this time in Vietnam where she gets to meet someone she never thought she'd get to meet. And I'm like, well, of course, you're fucking Jada Pinkett Smith. You get to meet him. The experience of standing next to Tiger's ease, generosity, and level of mastery and Tiger Woods dissolved my ego and allowed me to surrender the game. Who knew that golf could teach me to let go of the notions of winning and losing and instead to simply be present? That is such a funny thing to say about golf. The calming thing about golf is that there are no points. There are no winners. There are no losers. As I sat here next to one of the world's most winningest golfers, I thought to myself, this is a game of points and spirituality. She sat there and said, in my journey of going to every healer in the world to seek forgiveness outside and in, as I stood next to one of the most famous cheaters in America, I said, why not just be here? Come back, be here. I mean, I really was like, okay, Jada, you need to get a divorce. It's very clear what your problem is. You are in a horrible situation where you feel entangled with this man who has never once gotten to know you, cared about you, protected you. You are in his shadow. You have lost yourself. You will not get a divorce. And instead, now you're in fucking Vietnam playing golf. I can't. (laughs) It's a step too far. She ends up getting her own house. She's like, this is a huge step out of my marriage that's been over for 10 years. She bought herself a house and she had a 50th birthday party. And she's like, it's crazy. Well, might not even come. And then he does come. And she's like, that was kind of nice. I had turned 50 and I found my way home. Then we get to the Oscars. So she is surprised that Will asked her to be her date to the Oscars because they didn't even live together. They like hadn't been spending that much time together. Yeah, randomly, she's like, I was waking up in my mom's guest room and I realized this is probably time to move out of my mother's guest room. I'm like, Jada, how did you end up in a guest room? You guys don't have a Malibu house you could hang out at? So she's going to these award shows with him. He is having a big award season, right? This is for the Serena Williams movie. Yeah. So she's like, it's so weird that he like wanted me by his side. And I'm like, Okay, I don't want to be a bitch, but I do think that there's a lot to gain for him to like appearing as this strong unit. Especially when he's pushing a family man movie. He's pushing a biopic where he plays a famous father. It behooves him to have the mother of his famous children. I mean, to me, it like reminds me a lot of Tupac wanting to marry her when he was in jail. She's like, He really wanted me there. And I'm like, I think it like looks really good to be photographed next to you at times like this. So she had at one point been involved in that movie. And he's like, I want you to come on. She had picked out the director. Well, not picked him out, but she was like, I think you would like this director. And that's who they went with. So they had her on as a producer. And then they got into some huge blow up and she left the movie. And he's like, no, I still want you there. And she's like, random, but okay. And she's like, I didn't even think about being there as husband and wife. I thought of being there as family. So then he slaps Chris Rock and she has no idea if this is a bit, if this is scheduled. She's like, he's always in and out of a seat. I had no idea if it was like planned, if he even made contact. She didn't even know until later that he actually hit Chris Rock. And then when he's screaming, keep my wife's name out of your fucking mouth. She's like, wife, I'm your what? I'm like, I don't know. You are still legally married. And when you guys are photographed with each other, people say husband and wife. And you have made the public choice to decide not to tell anybody you're not together. And you publicly have this like weird thing where it seems like you cheated on him and he cried about it on Facebook Watch. So I will say Black Twitter, you guys knew exactly what happened there because everything she explains about what happened is exactly what you guys were saying on Twitter. So shout out. I think she might have just read Twitter. There's part of me that was like, I think she like went to Black Twitter and was like, what's the best explanation for why this happened? (laughs) And she's like, who's the best at defending Will and like building a case here? Basically, she's like, there's been a lot of animosity between Chris and Will. There was this history of Chris making fun of me. And then of course, she's like, you know, it was had nothing to do with me. And that's what hurts the most. She's like, so many people blamed me. All these people in the media were saying, well, look at the way Jada rolled her eyes. She made her husband go do that. And she's like, made my husband do one. He's not my husband. And two, I can't make him do anything. I can't even make him listen to me. So the idea that he's going to like lose it like that. She's like, he is somebody who has his own childhood demons. And that's what that was about. This is about Will standing up for the mother that he never stood up for. I actually found this part so devastating that like the one time he's ever stood up for her was a public show where she like needed no defense. She is like, yeah, I guess when I think about it, it is hurtful. Like I have alopecia and so it does hurt my feelings, especially on behalf of the alopecia community that he would make fun of my bald head. But like overall, I didn't feel the need to make a scene out of the moment. And just throughout this book, there are so many times like 
when she had to confront that guy in her kitchen, when her ankle was broken. Even just listening to her, when she says for my 40th birthday, I just want to like a quiet thing at home with you. He's never protected her. And then he has this whole public blow up that like honestly just puts her in more crossfire with internet people. Who are psychos. Yes. And now she's being blamed for him. I just really don't like Will Smith. And then she goes on to being like, well, then I had to stand by his side because people were so mean about the slap. In the media frenzy that followed, I realized I'm not any different from every hater and critic when it came to Will Smith. That is not true. He spent like 25 years making you feel bad about yourself. I had been willing to accept and embrace only that which I had considered pleasing behavior from Will. I did not know how to love him in his shadow state. The holy slap helped me learn how to walk hand in hand with Will with all of the bats and gremlins, the part of him that had been banished deep into the darkest exiled lands and to be a torch of love for him until he could find his own. Can I say, is that because you didn't want to or because you didn't know it was there because he wouldn't show you? Even after you begged for years to like let yourself in. I would argue that you actually have loved him in his shadow self. He has not been there for you. He's been a shadow in your life holding you back from feeling your emotions and expressing vulnerability because he's like, oh yeah, we're not a family that talks about feelings. He has made you sanitize every argument that you wanted to have. He's been his shadow self. And you loved that version of him until he made it impossible and you wanted to kill yourself. Tough stuff. It's really sad. Anyway, so it ends with her being like, we all did ayahuasca and now we're happy. They had this moment where she says, you are a king of my heart. And he says, you are a queen of my heart. And they recognize that basically when you co-parent, but with like a billion dollars of entertainment money under your belt, it's not co-parenting. It's being a king and queen of a land. Yeah. My hope is that you will recognize that every piece of your journey is to lead you to your own crown. I hope you will discover your own magic, your own powers, your self-love. My hope is that you'll find the golden threads to weave the inner kingdom that supports the making of your chosen life. And may you share the golden threads that you'll discover to help usher other heroines and heroes to and through their journeys. I think she needs to divorce Mel Smith. I think she could have really found a happiness. I guess I just think there's still so much time. She's only like 50. She could find someone right now or even in 10 years and still have like 20 years of good love. I mean, there's this part where she's like going to Vietnam and doing all this self-healing stuff where she's like, I cut out alcohol, I cut out sex, I cut out violent TV and music, I cut out this diet that I'd already been on that was intense but was making me sick, I cut out all wants, all worldly wants, all shopping to try and find an inner peace. And I'm like, I think you could just like go on a couple dates. How many worm teenies would you teen with Jada? I would have two actually. I like don't know if I would want to have a warm teeny with her at all because I feel like I would shake her. Part of me really likes her, but I'm worried that if like certain conversations came up, I'd be like, I can't listen to this. I feel like she would be a fun birthday party. Like you're at a birthday dinner and she's like one of the other people there, but you're not even you're like seated like diagonal. I wouldn't mind being seated with her. I feel like she'd be like a fun convo. She's fun to dance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would do one warm teeny. How fertile was the soil? Four out of five. Yeah. This was four and a half out of... There was a lot to work with here. And there was a lot that could have been cut. Yeah, but in that cut, there's mud pockets. Oh, lots of, lots of dirt. Can I ask you something, Ashley? Death. If you were to say you loved anybody in the world, who would it be? Person? Yeah. I think you, my family. I think if we're talking about, like, anybody, bug. (laughs) Do you not know where I'm going with this? And... (laughs) And our five-star reviewing wormies. Ding, ding, ding. What's up, guys? 